Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Modern Market. It's our daily show from Monday to Friday at 7 a.m. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. GMT. We get into everything to do with the NFT market, the crypto market, and how to make a lot or a little bit of money, and sometimes how to lose some money as well. That does happen uh, occasionally. Um, I'm your host, Bicek. I'm joined by my legendary co-host, Legendary and Sammy. And we're going to get into everything that's been going on in the past 24 hours. Some pretty big debate going on on the timeline about the $62 million hack. And we're going to get into that as well as get you up to speed with everything else that's happening so you don't miss out on anything. But just a reminder before we do that, nothing that we say here is financial advice because the space is incredibly risky and we do not know anything for sure. So please do proceed with caution and exercise your own judgment. No better time to reiterate that message, especially with the activity from the past 24 hours. Nevertheless, let's get into it. Legendary, it is Wednesday, the 27th of March. How are you doing? How are you feeling? GM, GM. Uh, I am on day two of my juice cleanse. I know that is raising a massive, massive red flag for K-sensei. Um, but hey, it's actually pretty enjoyable given the fact that so much is going on in the space. We have the hack and everything. So I don't really get to focus on the fact that I'm not eating and only drinking my juice. So it doesn't doesn't bother me at all. It doesn't impact my mood at all. Very, very excited for today's show. I do think we have a lot to reflect on what had happened um, over the last 24 hours. I mean, if you're in doubt, here is someone unaffected. Someone didn't deposit in Munchables because this guy is concerned about the juice in his fridge. I don't know if you shared that publicly. I'd love to share it with the people watching in on X and YouTube Legendary. This fridge of yours, why is there nothing in it apart from the juice? Like you're allowed, where, where are the other items? There's not anything at the moment. I mean, I'm, I'm going with the, I'm going with the serial killer vibes for uh, the juice cleanse. It's thing funny is, you say that. Why, why did it look like a serial killer thing? Like why, <laughs> when you said that, I was like, I completely agree. You do look like a serial killer right now because of all this juice. But what is the connection with all juice and serial killers? Uh, I don't know. I think just because it's nicely structured, six different juices a day in specific colors, and I color sorted that in my fridge to make it look pretty. Um, probably that dedication to the craft. Uh, in all honesty, I just had to remove and eat a lot of the other items that I had in my fridge just to make space um, for all the juices that I need to I mean, take over the next couple of days. <laughs> it, there's, it, there must have been some cosmic forces in effect, talking about juice all the time. The juice protocol, which we're actually investors in and who were very much like wrapped up in the big story of the hack yesterday. We're going to speak about how that was the case in just a little bit. Sammy, you want to throw to you first before we get into the headlines. How are you, where are you at with the kind of drama from the past 24 hours? Uh, so similar, similar from the sidelines. I didn't invest in, in Munchables specifically, but yeah, obviously indirect exposure to juice, similar to you guys. But um, yeah, just watching from the sidelines, it's just a wild place. And the fact that the guy just gave it back completely, it just blows my mind. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's been a, a wild sort of 12 hours watching that, keeping on top of it, but keen to get into it. Also, why, yeah. why, legendary, why don't you just buy a blender? This guy doesn't have time for blending right now. Legendary, you're still on mute. Uh, I do have a blender, but actually, I just, Peter said perfect. I don't have the time to prepare all the different juices myself and, <laughs> and do that in my KitchenAid slash Thermomix. It's just easier to buy that, have that house delivered, and store it in the serial killer fridge. <laughs> Having the blender and like doing the work would not give the sufficient serial killer vibes, I don't think. So yeah, uh, gotta stay, gotta stay in theme. Exactly. Um, okay. Well, people were like, we were adjacently affected in some respect. Well, legendary and Sammy was. I had. I've just wrote a tweet about this, so it's public. I don't mind sharing, and we'll talk about it in a bit. I had twelve ETH on uh, Munchables, so I wasn't very happy yesterday, uh, trying to figure out like what was going on. And kind of chalking it down to, you know, this is just part of the game. One of the things I, I tweeted was that I've never been to an expensive business school, but I think I just paid my tuition. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about what that tuition was uh, a little bit later going through. I think what was my first hack, because I haven't 
yet been hacked apart from this time. So we'll reflect on all that stuff in just a little bit. Let's get into the headlines first to get you up to speed with everything happening in the space from the past 24 hours. As always, this is in the snapshot, which is pinned up top. Um, if you do find it brings you some value today, please do give it a like. So we have crypto starting with the price action. Bitcoin is down a couple of percent at 69K. ETH is down 3% at 3.5K. Solana is down 4% at $185. Headlines, two main headlines for me today, because I think the timeline kind of got taken over. Munchable's treasury exploited by a team member for 62 million, but Pac-Man and Zach XBT negotiate return of funds. We'll get into the details in a bit on that. Number two, SquiggleDAO takes out a $1 million loan through Zata Finance. I don't know how much we're going to be able to discuss that today. Uh, we maybe will focus on the, uh, the treasury exploit, but let's see how we go. Uh, getting into some floor price action, we've got CryptoPunks down a couple of percent at 47 Bored Apes at 13.3, down a few percent. Mutants at 2.5. D-Gods up 5% at 1.6. Captains at 3.7. Azuki's at 5.3. Penguins at 13.1. Mad Lads at 157 soul. And Nouns winning bid was at 6.9. ETH, we had a CryptoPunk, a couple of, well, one CryptoPunk gold chain selling for 60 ETH. Um, the other CryptoPunks going through around that 50 ETH region. A Bored Ape Pizza selling for almost 20 ETH. Um, so there we go. That's some price action from around the scene. Legendary, before we get into the main headline on Munchables, uh, any reflections on anything catching your attention from a price action perspective? Um, to me, honestly, it's it's still mostly looking looking at the Zookies, seeing that they have maintained the little pump or the more significant pump that they had over the last seven days. Um, this is quite a quite a good sign that I saw also across a couple of different other collections where that's um, uh, revolving games with the Nexian Gems and the Skyborne Heroes as well as the RG Bytes and some other gaming collections being up nicely over the last couple of days. Seems like a bit more life is flowing back into the NFT market overall and especially also into the gaming narrative. Yeah, interesting. One reflection I have, Legendary, and maybe this is kind of a little bit of a peek behind the scenes of things maybe it's just indicative of who we are and the kind of connections we have but like a lot of the deal flow that we see is like hyper focused on gaming like do you think that's because why do you think that is is that just because of the type of people we know now the type of people you're like predominantly talking with or do you think it's just this is the main like the the kind of sector which is just on fire and therefore there's more stuff there like, do you have any reflections on that at the moment? I think there's three reasons for that. I mean, obviously, I am within the gaming bubble for sure. Yes. So I definitely have a network built within there. Um, reason number two, gaming is still a big, big trend. So a lot of the deal flow is going into gaming per se. A lot of what Animoca Brands does is going into gaming. And the third reason is because it is such a trend, you see gaming adjacent investments, whether that's mm -hmm. like infrastructure, deep in AI that also try to kind of frame a gaming narrative within whatever they're doing, even if it's just infrastructure, not just even if it's infrastructure they're building, they try to frame a narrative that is specific for gaming, it's solving the problems that gaming has, because it wants to nurture on, on, on that narrative. So I do think that all those reasons combined um, create that strong bias towards the intensity of gaming related deals that we're seeing. Yeah, I think I think that's fair. One of my reflections as well, looking at this stuff, is it's funny how many of these buzzwords people are trying to fit in to their to their company. Like I've seen mult I've seen multiple things now where it's like some type of AI gaming deep in infrastructure play, um, which is built on Solana. <laughs> that's that's the one you're missing. AI gaming deep in infrastructure play built on Solana with restaking on Eigenlayer, like. Of <laughs> um interesting stuff a little bit of a peek behind the scenes there of like some of the narratives and deal flow that we're seeing uh sammy anything catching your eye before we get into this munchable stuff i had a similar observation with the gaming stuff i saw that pixels that the farmland had pumped about 10 percent since yesterday um guilds i think are now live so and the pixel tokens also been it's dropped off a little bit, but it's up about 50% since launch. So that's being sunk into pets and uh, the price to enter these guilds. So it's just interesting to see that play out, but also uh, Mockiverse at 5%. So that could be probably linked to 
the token that's kind of coming up fairly soon. Um, but yeah, gaming seems to be the play. And I think deep in, so there's that one called gaming that went live yesterday. Mm. I don't know if that's just a play on the gaming word, but I don't know how to pronounce it, but that does seem to be that, that kind of thing. So it's interesting to see. Yeah, I've got to say, I missed that. I did not know that it was a deep in play. I thought they were just a gaming play. Um, I didn't fully understand the extent of their their business, I guess. Uh, so I kind of missed that one. Um, definitely a trend there, though. Like a lot of this stuff is coming to market either next month or the month after, or the month after, like seeing so many tokens coming to market. I'm kind of interested, just as a side question before we get into it, Legendary, like is the is the market bullish enough on all of this stuff to absorb all of these tokens coming in April, May, June? Because that's when they're coming, and like, are we ready for it? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. I think... Um, you also see a lot of founders trying to to rush their token and yes. get the gaming token, etc., out sooner yeah. than they expected to do it initially, or yeah. upgrade their game to a layer two to a bigger ecosystem that they would love to build but might not have built out yet. So I think that all is a result of the pressure of all those um, simultaneous TGEs that will happen over the next couple of months because I definitely don't think there is enough interest in the market just see how attention is flowing from you know from from base to blast from sofa on the telegram stickers that were trending yesterday to um other games we are not in the not at a stage where this space is talking about like three to four games at the same time or three to four plays at the same time it's like very mono um thematic and if you look at that from the gaming side of things and i probably know like 20 plus gaming tokens that will come out over the next three months, I definitely don't see enough interest in all of them. Yeah, interesting point. I think it's definitely something to keep on top of. I've sensed that they might, they're kind of in a race with each other now. Um, they're kind of in a race with each other to be out ahead of other people to try to at least capture the attention before the huge influx of everything happening at the same time. That's not to say that the quality won't still exist and the quality things will still be there and rise in value so i do think that there are quality plays to make both i guess on the nft side for the for the people that have nft projects that are are good but also from the investment side when you're getting in at i don't know 40 million fdv or 50 million fdv and these things are going to be much higher if they are one of the best better teams um okay very interesting stuff let's leave that there i'm happy to have brought that to people's attention let's get into the main headline then which is um all to do with the munchables hack um we've all like in, in, involved in in different spheres would love to bring nft stats into this conversation as well at some point because i know he was tweeting about it too so i'm going to share it on screen to kind of take you through the journey as i experienced it on the timeline yesterday to get you up to speed with how it kind of played out um and then we want to open this up to a bigger discussion because there is a bigger discussion to be had on the role of decentralization, what to do when something illegal like this happens. So here we go. So starting with the moment it happened about 13 hours ago, Munchables tweeted that Munchables has been compromised. We're tracking the movement, attempting to stop the transactions. We will update as soon as we know more. Zach XBT replied saying that 17.4K of ETH had been taken by the exploiter address that $62.5 million. Um, and it transpired that it was, <laughs> it might sound ridiculous, a North Korean dev was hired. And I don't know if that literally means a North Korean dev was hired or whether the North Korean has just become a meme for an anonymous person that we don't know. But this is what Zach said. And he did manage to share the uh, identity, or at least the anonymous identity of the hacker. It was a person called Werewolves. 0493 so basically it appeared that the team had outsourced the developer work and given it to this person who uh they obviously could not trust in the end um moving things forward zach tweeted a little bit later that uh, four different devs were hired by the munchables team actually and linked to the exploiter are likely all the same person so i they, I, I guess in their mind they thought they'd hired a variety of people 
but Zach's intuition or his research led him to believe that these people were actually potentially all the same person. And he's got this interesting diagram where I'm showing this for the people watching on video, where he's kind of traced the movements of ETH between those wallets, which kind of suggests that they might be the same person. This is not uncommon actually in the space where people are trying to scam people, where they pretend that there's more people. Um, and he provides a couple of other accounts that they thought that he thought were involved. Moving it on to kind of what could be done, Saigar, one of the top devs and technical people in the space, explained that the Blast team could technically recover the 62 million lost in the Munchables exploit since they control the bridge contract that holds the bridge uh, ETH and Steeth. Um, he went on to say it wouldn't set a good precedent for future exploits and issues, but it is possible. An invalid state route would need to be forced by the Blast team, which would erase the hacked transaction. The chain might need to halt completely to do this. Saga so went on to say, I don't think any rollup has done something like this on mainnet yet, but the bridge contracts are upgradable. The upgradability was mostly for any bugs related to fault valid validity proving, but a catastrophic exploit might be reasonable enough. Not a decision for me to make though. Um, and obviously one of the reasons why people are debating whether one of the reasons people were debating, should we, should the blast team exercise their ability to, you know, um, to erase the hack transaction, kind of reset it is because it would set a, a, a bad precedent for decentralization. The more decentralized maxis would say, we can't do that type of thing. It gives too much power to the people in charge and, uh, we don't want to set that precedent. If we do something like that, when we're, we're doing nothing different to the traditional financial system, who would be able to arbitrarily execute uh, set or be, be able to block certain people depending on their political, uh, economic or whatever uh, desires at any point in time. So that's the argument for, obviously the argument against would be something like what Ryan Selkis made who is the founder of, I can't remember the name, Masari Crypto, very respectable um, crypto institute, uh, kind of thought institution. Uh, he said, if 62 million more of hacked funds goes to uh, North Korea, or if it's alleged to go to North Korea, it's night night for crypto in the US, roll back the chain, Blast is a month old and can afford the debate. Um, so his position was that why, I guess the position is why watch people like honest consumers lose that money when you know that the funds are just going to a a a, a nefarious actor. Um, Dee's also tweeted, our options are give North Korea money or be centralized, open brackets, when we are already centralized. Uh, that one just made me chuckle, actually, um, because I guess people like to think we're super decentralized and maybe we're not as much as we think. So those were two options there. Um, a couple more takes that I thought were interesting. This was uh, a reply from Johnson. Uh, the main thing to blame the Blast team for uh, is not the actual exploit, as I see many doing. 62 million would not have been aped into this project if they weren't given 224K gold. The project is a zero without the gold. They should have just directly rewarded users whole who interacted with DAP. So to what extent do we think Blast has a responsibility from the from the gold perspective? Like when they're going to say this these protocols are going to get X amount of gold, should they be taking a little bit of a look there? Um I think maybe the final thing that I think is helpful, and then I'll get into my takes, but want to open it up to the stage first, is uh quit said this thing, which is pretty scary, to be honest. The Munchables exploit has been planned since deployment. Munchables is a dangerously upgradable proxy and it has been upgraded. Instead of upgrading from a benign implementation to a malicious one, they did the reverse here. So basically what happened is uh, the lock contract started off with an implementation, with one implementation address and the contract was unverified. Shortly thereafter, it was upgraded to a new implementation but before upgrading, the attacker was able to assign himself a deposited balance of 1 million Ether. Uh, if you never knew about the original implementation, the contract would look just fine. Another reason why upgradability should be discouraged, even if the dev had transferred ownership back to the team, the damage was done. 
Um, so that's where I want to leave it for now. There'll obviously be more interesting questions to come out of this. I think we've got a bunch of hands in the audience. I uh, want to bring NFT stats into this, but first, Legendary, what are your reflections on the exploit first? And then maybe we're going to obviously go into this discussion as to whether A, we should have rolled back the chain, B, we uh, let decentralization happen and just hackers will hack and you've just got to deal with it. Well, I guess three, the third option, which is use alternative methods to get hold of those funds, which is ultimately what happened because those funds have been uh, or seem to be on the way to being recovered and now they're figuring out how to get it back to users. So crazy few hours, everyone thinking they lost all the money, people look like they're getting all their money back now. Najdri, what's your first take? Yeah, first of all, thank you for that amazing summary. I think that's very helpful to have walked through everything. Um, what happened over the last 12 hours plus having having those statements. Um, I do think that something like that was bound to happen, not, not specifically Munchables, but it's just a, a chain that had attracted a lot of attention had attracted a lot of capital. It's obviously attractive for hackers to try to find an exploit, to, to find a way to steal money. I do think that that argument by the, the Masari person or founder, I can't remember his name, is a very stupid argument, if I can be quite blunt about that. Um, there is a um, UN Security Council panel that has been investigating crypto hacks since 2017, and they account more than 3 billion US dollars that have been specifically hacked from North Korean devs or from North Korea. So that is um, a lot more than those 60 mil. And it's not night night for crypto in the US that had happened before that will happen again. So I don't think that this is a good point to make. Um, similarly, I feel also strongly about that comment that it is Blast's fault because of gold and people are doing that because of gold. I think gold is just an analogy for us degens trying to farm something that promises a return. In this case, it's blast gold points that turn into blast points that hopefully turn into money at some point. In other cases, we ape into Sofamon because apparently Paradigm is behind that and people spend 70K on a Telegram sticker. Um, we will always ape into things quickly when we see an opportunity presenting itself and the timeline rallies around that. Um, and it's always a financial expectation. You always think, ooh, that's an amazing way to farm blast gold. That's an amazing way to get a token by a protocol that's backed by Paradigm. And just putting the name on Blast because they have Blast called as an incentive is a very, very uh, simplistic take. So I definitely do disagree with that. I have quite a lot of thoughts on um, halting the chain versus um, versus continue doing business as usual, et cetera. But I do think um, that I will provide those a little bit later on in the discussion because otherwise it gets just too much for one single take. Okay, I, I agree with you that because there's various things to discuss at this first point. Um, Sammy, let's go to you first, then we'll go to NFT stats, then Jack, Kusho, and Tiro. Sammy, what are your thoughts first, like headline reflections coming out of yesterday? Well, the first thing I want to address is that Legendary has just told me that I'm ex exit liquidity for SofaMon because I just kept on this morning, so, so that's not good. But uh, yeah, so I think... I just want to commend like they've they've the outcome they've got they've they've managed to recover the funds seamlessly without any sort of repercussions so the chain hasn't been halted so I don't know what negotiation negotiations went on behind the scenes but kudos for that and I think Cirrus ended up sending a tip to uh, Zach which is a good gesture to to say look you're doing a good job without you like the space would be a lot worse so I think those those were positive things coming out of it I do think the security needs to be like. We're all guilty of that. Like we just assume that there's a certain level of security for these applications that are being built on, on there. And there's disclaimers on the Blast website about even if they're on there, it doesn't mean that they're like fully vetted. But I do think we need to do our own due diligence. There is some blame that lies with us as users. But I do think that um, I, I think that it's not going to be the last time we see it. Um, I think there will be a lot more like this. Uh, I think you can't you can't concentrate capital into something that you you're not willing to lose, so yes. only put in what you can. You're willing to lose, uh, and I think there's been a few people that have had a bit of a, a rude awakening to that. Um, yeah. I think that yeah, it's the the, the centralized data database point. I think like all these gold, uh, sort of blast gold, the points. That's all like imaginary numbers on a centralized database that 
Pac-Man and the team are kind of monitoring. Um, there is probably a way around that, but until that becomes Blast tokens, like it's not decentralized. So it is a very centralized ecosystem at the moment. Yeah. Um, so I can see arguments on both sides, but yeah, it's 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 a bit of a, a wake up call, I think. I, I agree with you. And I like the idea of thinking it as a wake up call. On a personal level, I definitely looked at my thing. And it's interesting, you mentioned the goal points and I agree I agree with you that it's a factor. I also agree with legendary that it's like, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. It doesn't mean that you should either be doing things more or not doing things more, but on a personal level, I think it definitely got me more excited about things. This idea that we're explorers going around the chain, sometimes going into dangerous places in order to try to get the gold. And when I look, reviewed my portfolio yesterday evening or the extent to which I'd like put different things in different places in blast. I did conclude, okay, I, like I'm generally pretty good at managing the risk and making sure it's not too much in different places. I'm always pretty happy with how I go about things, but I did look at it and be like, okay, I think there's a little bit too much in some protocols that I didn't think I knew enough about. So, uh, I did like amend certain things. Uh, but in general, I, I think agree with you a very good wake up just to be like, look guys, keep going into this stuff with your eyes open. Um, so I think it's reasonable from that perspective. Um, would love to bring, before we get into like specific issues, we'd love to give NFT stats, Sam, the opportunity just to give some headline impressions, any, take it in any direction you want, Sam, welcome to the stage, my friend. What are your thoughts What's and reflections up, on this at the moment? So much to talk about so many different topics. Legendary. I gave you a thumbs down emoji when you said something that that was so aggressive. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> <laughs> man, that thumbs down is aggressive. Like but, it. Uh, like yeah. it. The, the place I disagree is like, I think obviously we are in a space where everyone is responsible for their own funds. That is a hundred percent true. But you know, I think just like an influencer going online saying, Hey, everyone, you should buy this. You should put your money in Munchables. Blast went out and said, you know, we are giving 200,000 blast point or blast gold to this project, which is an endorsement. And it, it is an endorsement. And I think that there is a question mark here it's not only an endorsement it's saying please interact with this with this protocol so that you can get gold and everyone is responsible for their own decisions but at the same time to say that's not an endorsement is to just remove responsibility from anybody like it, for the things they say and do and i think this is a black mark because you are endorsing a project which had uh, anonymous founders i think we got like how, why, do, why are we in a space where we, where people are so afraid to give us their name, but they're not afraid to take on $50 million of other people's money, mm. but you can't even give us your name. Like it, like that just feels wrong. I mean, this clearly was not audited. And I think if a protocol of blast size, of blast size that is incent, incentivizing so much speed, incentivizing so much money to be thrown around, uh, with with their system is not at least doing the basics of like can can I get on the phone with this founder, you know hire a few like these guys have so much money hire a few people call the founders, uh, do an audit like I, I think like that's the bare bones that you should be doing if you are going to be you know giving out so much incentives telling your users this is something that we will pay you to interact with so. I, I think, again, it is on the users. This space is not one that is kind to people who blame other people, you know, and I think there's no room for that. But at the same time, I think there are a lot of people who need to do a bit of introspecting here uh, and, and figure out, okay, how can we build this in a way that is super growth charged, but also isn't putting our trust at risk? What do you think? It's an interesting perspective, Sam. Thank you for that alternative view. What do you think would be the way that looked like because in order for them to kind of take more responsibility and say yes you know we're going to be paying you or incentivizing you to use these protocols therefore we take the responsibility a little bit we're obviously going to need to do our dd on on these protocols that are launching on our l2 which means that obviously increases their workload maybe it becomes a little bit more of a stamp do you see there being some type of body council that confirms like okay yes uh, anonymous team, non-anonymous team, docs dev, not docs dev, like it's some kind of checklist of things where look, can't cover every single thing, but they already have a team. I mean, they're, they're out there 
putting ratings on this and deciding who gets gold. Someone's doing that. And like they, they have taken, they have a team. Like someone is making these decisions and they're telling people where they would recommend that we put our money. Yeah, so there right. is a team doing that. I don't know who it is, but it, I mean, this is going to be a $10 billion token. Like start acting like one. Yeah. Interesting like, point. To say you, we don't have the resources to hire people who actually take dev seriously. I mean, Obviously, this one, you know, Manifold is their market maker. Manifold invested in this one. They hadn't even launched a single product yet. They used mid-journey AI uh, images, like zero product. It was it's insanely buggy. Uh, they like they literally launched it the day gold was distributed, and you know, their investors were the same. Like it just, but there was no product, and you're giving them as much as you're giving Wasabi or Orbit or other projects. Like, yeah, that, like that. I'm I'm just saying that's a fuck up. And, you know, and there's a lot of blame to go around here, but I think that, I mean, clearly the team has redeemed themselves and like, this was a, a incredible outcome that, that, that Pac-Man was able to, to, to pull off here, but to say that there's no response, but I think some, like, I think people are so into blaming users for their own mistakes that you sometimes don't say, okay, well, that was also fucked up by that. Like again, you like I think that I just think that, that that's something that just like I personally feel responsible if I tweet about something that goes wrong. Like I personally am like, fuck, I just let my users down. That hurt my reputation. How can they gave this app a six out of six score on their one out of six ranking for how good an app is? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, that, that's an issue. Yeah, I think that's very, very fair points. I want to come to uh, legendary to have a chance to kind of uh, respond to that. Then we want to work our way around uh, the house and maybe push on to think about the the ultimate solution as well. Legendary first. Absolutely, yeah. No, I didn't. I didn't blame users at all. I mean, obviously, I think blaming users is stupid. Um, I think it is important. The only important takeaway is if you make a bet on a protocol that you don't really understand, make sure you can afford to lose the bet. Going around in this space and blaming users is absolutely not helpful. Like I'm the number one DJ when it comes to aping into a thing I don't understand because I'm afraid the opportunity is gone in two minutes otherwise. So definitely not about blaming users. Uh, from the perspective of Blast Gold, I don't fully agree with you, Sam. I do think that many L2s are structured in a similar way that you have a protocol page, you have boosted rates on Manta. If you put your money in shoe bill finance in their bank or in other things. Um, I do think that Blast took it a step further, obviously, with like attributing a gold value to that. But that incentive structure is like the, the fundamental of the incentive structure of interact with protocols to farm an L2 ecosystem token is pretty much the same across different um, L2s. I do think where I really agree with you is the outcome is amazing. No, not stopping the chain, returning the funds. And I do think that Pac-Man and the team are very well aware of the fact that they were controlling the bridges so basically, they are the they are at the gate where funds enter the chain, where funds exit the chain. So I'm pretty sure that someone in there had the thought: in case a fuck up happens, we have a pretty good chance to make sure that the money is not exiting the chain, and we can see how we fix a fuck up like that because we're not auditing all the protocols. Like I'm not meaning this in a way to defend um, Pac-Man or the team, but I do think the outcome is is amazing, and I do think that. That incentive structure is very similar across most of the L2s. You also take it further than I did. I was I was saying it's users' fault. Like I think I think and I think every user uh, who was part of this will take blame for, for it as well. Like I think it is partially users' fault. But again, if if you if you're out there giving a DAP score and saying we will specifically give out a ton of money for interacting with this specific app, mm -hmm. that's what happened here. They said we will give you a ton of money for this specific one more than if you interact with other ones, then yes, that is a black mark. Yeah, the, I'm, I'm thinking about it from the legal perspective where I appreciate, I, I take all of those points and there is this kind of gold incentive, although it's never, I mean, the, the word you use, Sam, was an endorsement. And I guess, I, I guess- what, Six out of six score isn't an endorsement. I, look, I, 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 I know you would give more money for this and other apps. Look, I'm not talking legal talk. I'm yeah. not talking legal talk. Yeah. I'm just saying, this, I'm not saying they're legally responsible. I'm just saying like, I'm not legally responsible for having tweeted, I just bought these munchables. Sure, sure, sure. But that's bad for my reputation. And yeah. I own that. 
yeah agree and and i guess maybe we'll never be able to get the full ownership of it because of i guess the only reason i'm linking it to legal stuff is because i think i agree with you it's bad for the reputation bad for the things to um be endorsing in that particular way but we'll never get that communication in writing from the protocol for, because of the legal perspective uh which oh, of course of yeah. course and I, i'm not making a legal case here. Sure. i'm just none of us are talking about legal stuff we're just talking about like hey like who's in the right who's in the wrong here like yeah uh, there's, there's one issue sorry i want to jump in on this real quick there's one issue with that kind of thinking is because i also saw other takes saying Jews is to blame because Jews opened a vault for 5,000 ETH and they should have done the due diligence because if I put my money in a vault that has such a big number with so many zeros, someone has certainly done the audit, then Jews can say, but Blast is to blame because they did the gold coin distribution. And at the end of the day, everyone's like pushing blame away from themselves because nobody wants to do due diligence themselves. And like from a user perspective, I mean, of course, fundamentally, you're right. Users are to blame, but I don't want to run around and blame users for that. But if if that the default mindset is I invest in a protocol because Paradigm backed it or because Juice has 200 mil TVL, and if they have a 5K vault for Munchable, someone surely has done the audit, then you will never really start thinking for yourself and assessing risks. And I'm not saying go out there as a user and do a smart contract audit because, quite frankly, nobody, almost nobody has the skills to do that but at least think about that the risk that you're taking and the bet size that you're making with such a bet, but don't assume just because there's a big number and a big name attached to a protocol that someone has done due diligence or audit just because you didn't do it and give yourself like a false sense of security. Yeah. I'm not saying, I, I mean, this is a massive blunder for juice. Like juice is out there the, for any curator. This is a blunder. Like juice is, juice was out there saying 5,000 ETH, let's do 7,500 ETH. Yeah, that's bad for them, and it's also was a mistake for the people who put their money in. Like this, this isn't like it is not like a thing where it's like I'm not to blame because use is to blame. No, use. I, my first thing is that this is an industry where if you want to blame other people, you, you should leave because ultimately it's your money. That's 100 percent true. But juice was out there putting more and more ETH in, and what that shows me, what that shows me is that juice doesn't do due diligence. So I don't trust Juice any like Ju like I saw them as a curator in the past. I was like, okay, I can trust Juice because they're going to do some due diligence. And now I just know that's not true. Like so, that's just true. That doesn't mean that I'm not to blame. It just means like, okay, like these guys' word is a lot less valuable than I think it's in their business interest for their word to be. Like that is true, and it's also true that people who decided to put money in this made a big mistake. All those things are true at the same time. Yeah, I think I think what we're coming to the conclusion is that there's a lot of blame across the board here, and not a lot of people necessarily. It's not blame; it's reputational damage. Yeah, it's not blame. It is us all realizing that other people don't know what they're talking about. Like it's just more of that. It is not blame. It is saying, okay, these are just not guys we should trust because they don't do their due diligence. They seek fees before they seek before they decide to do a docs conversation and do an audit. Okay, that's good to know for the next one. Yeah, important to take uh, that information on board. Um, we want to keep it moving. Let's go to, I think we said we we're going to go to Jack first here. Jack, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, on the hack and the kind of uh, activity after? All right, firstly, I just love what this show provides because I think both Sam Legendary, uh, everyone has just given such such a clear take on, you know, basically we're on the same page, but there's still such wide variety of that page it, it's kind of wild um but look i i think for me this is something i've shared on other shows before that one thing we definitely need to learn from all of this is the fact that the um the danger or the risk to what you are investing in does not solely lie with the token itself going to zero naturally like you know it doesn't solely lie to, oh, this thing has a yield that can't possibly, you know, retain. And, you know, I'm doing the math of X. And therefore, as long as within 15 or 16 days, as long as I have that yield, then I will make my money back. Whatever that math is, you really need to take the orders in and like the security risk on board when you're putting your, you know, hard-earned ETH at risk. And look, this, this is not new. Like literally this time probably last year almost like almost to the day 
Um, there was a like sort of a, a a play on DeFi world again. Like NFTs have slowed down a little bit, and um, I was looking at like DeFi for probably the first time. I was so heavily into NFTs before that, and I started following this YouTuber who just like he was a teacher prior to this, and he was talking about all these protocols, and he's going really really heavy on this protocol. But in one of the videos, he just mentioned that the biggest risk could actually be a security risk. Um, and I think it was like six days you would need to get your yield back. It was like incredible yield. Um, and the project had been built, you know, by like a really reputable team. And it was a North Korea hack. And it was like a big one. And he basically just ghosted like this this YouTuber, this influencer, just lost all his credibility, even though he was very clear about the dangers. I was so close to putting a ton of ETH into this thing for the first time. Fortunately, I just procrastinated, but I would have lost a ton because that one didn't get back. Like, I think this is the difference. Like, if this was actually like North Korea in terms of like from their government side, there's no way this money would have went back. So people need to understand this outcome that happened with with Blast and with Pac-Man isn't one that's going to always happen. You are not protected to the levels you are. Um, and then, like, final point from me is... I, like I understand the rollback, uh, you know the the questions on this. I understand the requests for like more auditing from that team. They are, you know, a top tier team who have been injected with a ton of liquidity. So you know all this like first mover advantage, and you know you do have to act quick in this space, and that does give you an opportunity to you know hit a risk like what we've seen today. But also, you've got to understand that, like, if that rollback had happened in the way that people were asking it for, it would have just been a PR nightmare. And I don't think they would have recovered. Like, this this might be, yeah, I know I'm on the other side to a lot of people's takes on this. But where does it stop? Is it like, oh, you know, there's, there's NFTs that have been stolen? What value? 60 million to 6 million to, like, at what point do they not do that investigation? And how much work is involved in that? I just can't see that sort of marketplace ever recovering. So, yeah, yeah I, that, that's sort of my take on that, B, and I'll let you get to the other hand. I appreciate it, man. I think it's, an, it's a very interesting question, and maybe let's get to the core of that now uh, since you started to go there. To, from, a, from a very simplistic answer just to deal with one of your thoughts, um, the law in some ways has developed to answer some of the questions of that nature. So... When people ask the question like, where will it end? Um, or where does it start? Where does it end? The reality is in the real in in the way the law develops is that that people come up with an arbitrary number and they'll and they they use the word reasonable quite a lot. So in a lot of legislation, there'll be things like um, you know, any any company that is bigger than a hundred million dollars turnover or something it's just a completely random example but like when it comes to like trying to regulate particular types of companies for maybe um anti-competitive practice or something like you know you and you might say oh where does it start where does it end and in the end the way that people have to make a call is they have to pick a number like they'll look at all the data and they'll have to pick a number and it's unfortunate if you know say you got hacked and it was under that number you're like, oh, but what about the people who are five million above, and now their funds are safe, but mine aren't? It's kind of like in the UK, even for banks. I think you're in, in a in a bank, your funds are insured or guaranteed by the government up to eighty k. Um, anything above eighty k is not insured, and you like if if, the, if it goes down, you won't get it back. Um, but you know, where did that number come from? I don't know. They've obviously done some research about like how much money people have in banks and they kind of pick that number. So it's one of these things where in the end, if you want to get to a, a decision, like, yes, yeah, you're going to have to have a group of people, you're going to have to do the research, you're going to have to come up with numbers and loads of people are going to disagree with you. And that's ultimately the real, real challenge of law and governance. Um, and I guess we're in a space at the moment where we're, we, we haven't necessarily had those conversations and we don't know the answers to those questions so that's what we're kind of just talking about at the moment i've got some more thoughts on it in a second uh, but i know we've got a few more opinions to hear so i want to hear them first but conscious we've only got 10 or so minutes left we might run a little bit over today let's see how we go kusho we said we we're going to come to you next welcome to the stage my friend 
Uh, what are your thoughts on the, let's take it to the conversation of the outcome. The outcome was that they did manage to negotiate. Uh, they did manage to get in touch with the hacker. They managed to com- get that commitment to send the funds back. I believe it's already been sent, uh, but someone can confirm on that. It seems to be all solved. Do you think that was the best outcome? What did you think with the alternative options? I did, I genuinely think that was like the best possible outcome because we've seen many upon many hacks in crypto and that haven't gone that way. We've seen people run away with millions of dollars and never come back. We've seen people go away, it's cost free, no justice whatsoever. And I think it ties back in with the thing you posted earlier about people wanting to be in something where they know that there is a bit of justice if something gets done to them or it's done that's not in favor of them. So it's like a thing of now the conversation then switches towards decentralization and what that means for us. And I think at this point, full decentralization in the way that many people imagine it to be, is just like, I think a dogmatic thing at this point. It's not realistic, it's not pragmatic. Because take for example, in the case of Blast. Blast was shipped extremely fast and the protocol was sent live in a very short amount of time compared to other L2s. And simply because of that, many other projects that want to build on Blast also will want to ship at the speed of life. So where you see that happening is like, people would put together teams without as much due diligence as they would do if they say had like one year or two years of development stretch. So it's like people want to quickly put together a team, want to quickly put together a protocol, a project that's going to go out there that's going to be reputable within the ecosystem since it's a new ecosystem. And simply because of that, we're going to see a lot of risks like this. And I think because of how fast Blast and things on top of Blast were shaped, it only makes sense that there's a gatekeeper in front of the bridge to kind of like be there in the event of things going wrong. It's only, it's a very good hedge. I think it's a very good hedge. And I think this negotiation is simply because they had that leverage to negotiate. Yeah. So it's a case of if it was a situation where they couldn't block the bridge and there were bridges that, you know, the hackers could have used to get out, then what leverage would Parkman have to discuss with the hacker? What leverage would they have yeah. to present to them and be like, yo, give us back this money and you can get this? Or how would they have that conversation? So the reason they only have that conversation is because they have that leverage. And that leverage is because there's some level of centralization. Yeah. So I think this is the best possible outcome. But it's only the best possible outcome because of what we've had to sacrifice in the form of like true decentralization and whatnot. Okay. Interesting, Tay. I, 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 I like a lot of those thoughts. I'm going to share on the back of that. I'm going to share what I wrote earlier because you referenced it specifically in reference to the decentralization point and uh, the specific outcome achieved. Because I think it might be interesting. It's kind of a different take to maybe some people's conclusions. Um, and I'm showing it on the screen for people watching in. Uh, Sammy, would love to come to you after this directly. Um, haven't heard for you in a sec, so I want to hear your thoughts on this, and then we'll try to get some more thoughts in. I said, this is the third reflection, actually, on a variety of uh, on my reflections after thinking that I lost uh, a bunch of money yesterday. Um, my third reflection was, cornering an individual and blocking path out is not a W for de- decentralization. Seen a few takes that Blast had two options, roll back the chain or do nothing and let the hacker have the funds because of decentralization. A third take, which is actually what happened, was use other tactics to convince the hacker to return the funds. Think this was done by closing all the bridges and establishing communications with the hacker. Whilst I think this is a great solution, I would not go so far as to say this is a W4 decentralization, like I saw some people say. It's the equivalent of the USA saying, we won't freeze your funds but we will also not let them out of our payment rails, which in my opinion is highly centralized. It's just a kind of different form of centralization. In the end, there has to be a more nuanced take than full decentralization versus freeze everything slash roll back the chain. When I think about the establishment of empires, which I liken to the creation and development of blockchains, there is always a rule of law. It is arguable that one of the British empire's greatest exports is its rule of law, putting aside the other pros and cons of empire for a second. The point being empires will not thrive without rule of law. People need to feel that justice will be done. And that's what Kusha was referencing earlier. Um, and I think justice was done in this case. And maybe uh, it has to be just like we determine justice on a case by case basis, IRL. Maybe that is something we should be thinking about here. Those are just my like headline thoughts, very 
green to the situation when, as I was reflecting on it this morning from what happened yesterday. Sammy, want to come to you first. Do you have any specific thoughts? Want to hear from legendary NFT stats? And then we'll try and get a couple more Miss A and T row in as well. Yeah, I, th I think we we also need to look at the look in the context of the maturity of the chain because I think ultimately when you first start out, you need to it probably needs to be more centralized to get it off the ground before you fully decentralize it. Uh, and I, I look at like a an alternative option to making good on people who have lost money in a more mature environment where you have an insurance pool. So once it's decentralized, mm -hmm. you're effectively accumulating these funds for that rainy day. So you're taking mm -hmm. in a traditional sense, you take premiums up front with a view that on those rainy days, you pay out claims or you hope that that That's buffer good. pays out claims. So there are insurance decentralized insurance pools that set that up. So they'll, they'll probably take, and I know Blast do have this because on the bank, Bankless podcast that uh, went live yesterday, Pac-Man discussed this before the hack, oh. which was quite ironic. But Interesting. Um, the, the the concept just it makes sense in terms of if if there are um, incidents that happen on the chain that people make a loss on, then those victims or, or people who have made that loss can make a claim for that fund to then be paid out. So it would be done in a centralized uh, self like governance way. Um, but that is another option. And the insurance market within like the decentralized space is actually becoming a lot more mature. Um, yeah. I remember speaking to people at this conference, so DAS conference in London about two years ago, and they already had them set up then. So you can imagine in two years, that's going to become a lot more mature. They'll, they'll integrate that into a, ma a mature ecosystem, more so than, the, than a young ecosystem. Because I think the issue with Blast at the moment is they wouldn't have built up enough of that premium to then cover the claims because it's only been around for a month or whatever. But if you have something that's been around for two, three years, and they're taking a cut of those fees that are being put on the chain every day for two years, three years, that can build up a period of time. And then all of a sudden you've got this buffer that yeah. when you do have these black swan events, they can pay this out. So I think we're not there yet, but I think in two, three years, you're gonna have a chain that's gonna be relatively mature, that's gonna have that more decentralized feel to. And by relatively, I, I, lo I love that idea. It's kind of taking the conversation in a different direction, but insurance is obviously a huge part of the way the normal economy works, largely absent from everything that we do. And maybe when you speak about the maturation of this side of things, what that means is like a fully insured chain. Like who knows, how, who knows what that would cost? I don't know what the cost of that would be or what the implications of that would be fully, but very, very interesting to think about it from that perspective. Uh, so thanks for that contribution, Sammy. Legendary, want to come to you, want to hear from NFT stats also. I think we'll run a few minutes over today. We've got more than 200 people live with us. I think this is a very interesting conversation to have out for a few more minutes. Legendary first, uh, any reflections on my post? Uh, do people feel like justice needs to be done? And was it done in this case? Um, agree with a lot of parts in your post. I do agree with the, the, the export um, of the law in the case of the British Empire and the feeling of just needing to be done. Definitely agree with that. Also on the thoughts on, on centralization versus decentralization, I'm someone who loves decentralization a lot, but I also am realistic enough to admit that it often can't really work out, especially if you have proof of stake as an underlying consensus mechanism where you just basically open consensus up to the people who are able to pull the most wealth into a chain. And if you just look at how the global wealth is distributed, and I don't want to make this a philosophical discussion, but just the top 10% on 75% of the net worth or of the net assets in the world. And you basically translate that also to how centralized ETH is becoming with Lido or centralized mm -hmm. other blockchains are. I do think that it is easy to say, oh yeah, I love decentralization and it shouldn't stop the protocol, which is something that I fully, or the, the blockchain, which is something that I fully agree with, but on, on an underlying level, it is a space that is still so early where even the overall like market cap of ETH is so small that it's easy for wealthy people to take a centralized um, yeah. stake in it because it's just not a lot of money. It is like yeah. 450, um, 450 billion dollars. If you compare that to the financial markets or the stock markets or whatever other markets, it's just not a lot of money. It's easy to be a centralized player in that if you are wealthy or if you are wealthy and are able to pull funds. So that decentralization conversation is not an easy one to answer or to solve. Yeah, uh, very fair takes. Would love to hear uh, NFT stats is kind of, kind of con if not conclusive thoughts, reflections on the actual outcome 
and whether we need to kind of decide these things on a case by case basis. Sam, do you have any any thoughts on that? I've been a bit in and out of the conversation, so I feel like I'm a little worried. I'm going to say something that's not really in line with what's been discussed. I, I, like, I think like I think this outcome was very very good for for Pac Man. I mean, and and for Blast in general. Like, clearly, you know, they did have to shut down the rails. They shut down uh, they, they shut down movement of USDB. So it wasn't like you know, it wasn't like there weren't some centralized like flexes that happened here. But at the end of the day like nothing got rolled back um people got their money back or will allegedly get their money back uh hopefully the hacker you know hopefully. the hacker did not win like it, it feels like it's hard to say that this was not a good result i think the idea of justice being served is a term i've heard mentioned a few times like i think that's i think we're kind of in the wrong space for that like i think at the end of the day like this is just an excessively unforgiving environment that we're in yep. we're almost all mistakes go deeply punished and it doesn't matter if you were right or wrong and it's my least favorite thing about this space um i think you know i personally prefer a system where there's more forgiveness of very like i think innocent mistakes i and i think that it's the it, to me it's a huge issue and barrier to entry that we face so you know but at, at the end of the day i think this this was a good outcome i again i would not say that we are if if justice is your goal i think that this is a place that will regularly let you down though but yeah a very fair take i think on on justice there uh, a couple of final takes we want to uh, come to a conclusion with a few uh, uh big takes we've got miss a and tiro coming up miss a what are your thoughts thanks for joining us welcome to the stage uh what are your thoughts on the final outcome here uh you're welcome i think a couple of things one what nfc stats was saying is really quite vital we're still in such an infancy stage to this whole industry right and one of the things that's missing is something that's quite prevalent in digital transformations and fortune 100 in the web 2 space right which is basically pr change management expectation management, resource planning, talent acquisition. I think those, I'm taking a whole different point of view from this perspective because a lot of what you see happening is a lot of these protocols are developing quite fast. And the sort of the motto in the tech space for having over two decades in it is kind of like, do it quick and like, let's get it done. And let's deal with the problems a little bit later, right? Mm -hmm. That's a little bit of a challenge because then you run into certain situations like this yeah. where this hack does happen. But the really positive thing that we can look at, because I used to be channelist certified, is that we're actually 50% down in hacks from okay. 2019 to 2023. So we're actually gone down. So what's happening is, of course, I don't know who the gentleman said that when you put an attraction of incentivizing a populace to do something, someone has to take responsibility for that sort of uh, that egging people on, you know what I'm trying to say? When you egg people on, you're kind of, you're motivating them. You're incentivizing them with something. And greed is a really hungry green eyed monster that will do a lot of things, but I'm grateful that the money was, I'm grateful that it was returned. I'm grateful that they have managed to sort of reset a bit. Yeah. I'm grateful that they didn't, you know, that they didn't have to sort of Go, I'm grateful that they learned from previous years, right? This sure. is what's happened. They've learned from previous years. And I think as we continue to evolve this space, we have to take the best practices of PC, Web 1, Web 2, and Web 3. Like we need to bring them forward and not just sort of throw throw the baby out with the bathwater. Do you know what I'm saying? We can't just be like, okay, we don't need this stuff. No, you need transparency. You need structure. You need planning. You need like strategic planning. You need accountability. And these are the things. You need, you need PR. You yeah. need public relations. So in summation, I think that we're starting to see a craft of this decentralized slash centralized space, which is going to play together nicely. And we're still kind of finding our sea legs, I guess yeah. you could say we're, trying, we're finding our sea legs. And that's important because yeah. no one, we're not right or wrong. We're just trying to decipher how more people could enter the space and we could avoid some of these problems. But then the final note, with change management because I've done a lot of change management in web too. Look, as much as people want change, they don't. So the reality is as much as they want the change, they fight it. So at some point, some people have to fall and scrape their scrape their knee and some, some have to fall more often than others. And, you know, it's just par for the course in the space that we're dealing with. Yeah, and this is just where we're going to go. Yeah, I love it. I, I really appreciate the statistic 
that we are down significantly on the number of hacks because i think that's it's very helpful to know that because i think as nft stats was saying like this feels like such an unforgiving space and it definitely is but maybe relative to the past like it is improving potentially so like if that number is improving yes this is not a forgiving space yet it is still incredibly difficult to navigate incredibly difficult to like operate with complete confidence sometimes even for more sophisticated players but if it's at least it going in the right tra trajectory that is uh something that's helpful sam i've seen you come off mute do you want to come in on that yeah i would just love to i'll, I'll dm you miss but i would love to see that data like i've, I've part of my view has always been that there's more financial incentive to hack than there is to prevent them so this problem i have seen in my experience feels like it's getting worse not better or at least staying the same so i'd be very curious like i find a lot of the macro data around kind of legality and hacks yeah um, um, not I'll pop super the link. trustworthy in this space or just I'll pop the link it just that. doesn't feel as buttoned up as yeah. i think it wants itself to come across as Please do share the link, Miss A. Uh, that'd be really helpful. Um, one of the things to your point, Sam, that I was thinking when Sammy was speaking about insurance, I was thinking even like from the incentives perspective, does that somehow make it even more uh, incentive or positive incentive for hackers because they know that they're just going to keep getting paid out by insurance people? So I think there's like all kinds of incentives to uh, consider. Did you want to come back there? Oh, maybe not. Um, if I could just jump in, be check because something's very interesting about what you said about incentivizing people to hack. As a smart contract developer, baby smart contract developer for the past seven years, we are, they are white hat hackers out here, which are actually being with bounties, we're being incentivized to do the work of looking through these myriad of smart contracts to find the 141, 42 exploits that are known on the Ethereum protocol. And that's just standard. And what, what's really scary is that some of these errors that you're seeing now are quite, um, with all due respect, they're, quite, they're not that complicated errors. So they're almost careless. And I think this is where if you're looking for an overrun type of error or an exploit where the lock of the contract could be opened or someone else could slip in there like what just happened with the OX uh, dev. These are things that are like almost to the, to the general populace, they might seem super complicated, but to those that know what they're doing, they're not that complicated, right? And this is where the delicate balance is, where there is a whole industry of audit and hacking and hackers that like Hacker Noon, you have Immunity, uh, Immunify, you have a lot of white hat bounty companies that actually work with incentivizing people like myself and others that are contractors yeah. to find this. And I think this is what makes the space decentralized because we're not incentivized by a company, which is really important. And the one thing that I would say that's important is that we've actually gotten more recovered funds since Mt. Gox and Bit Bitgrail back in like literally 2008. Coincheck, Mt. Gox, Crypto Cryptopia. We've gotten more money back from those years. So in 10 years, we have to look at the, the delta yeah. of what it was think, back then to what it is now. Yeah, would, would, yeah. I think seeing that data would be really, really helpful. Um, so I, and I, I, I suspect my feeling is that that's, that, that's definitely encouraging. Uh, I haven't been around long enough to 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 really feel that data come in though. So uh, thank you so much for the contributions, Miss A. I think it would be yeah. If you could pop a link to any of that data in the comments for people who are interested, uh, would love to see all of that stuff. Great contribution, uh, T Row. We said we were going to come to you. One final take. We've run over today because we think it's been an interesting conversation. One final take from you, T Row. Make it a quick one, please. Send us out. What's your take? So decentralization takes a lot of adults that have to work together and trust each other. That's what we don't understand. A lot of people don't understand. Um, and you have bad actors that play in decentralization. Um, you're not going to be able to uh, uh, align with uh, what you're saying and putting out as far as protocols and making sure that they're, they're, they're secure. Um, um, they were very lucky in this case because if one of the bridge contracts that were written from ETH to BLAST was compromised by the same group or people or the single person that exploited and, and pulled the 62 million out, there would be a way to bridge it back into the mainnet ETH 
uh, Ethereum network, and we might not be having the same outcome today. So we have to look at the good actors in the space, like Zach XBT, um, that literally is going above and beyond to navigate through the 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 uh, uh, the, the ETH. Uh, um, the Ethernet scan data and, and following these wallets and doing the research to make sure um, that these bad actors are found and we can locate them and, and try to get these funds back. We he was Pac-Man and yeah. Blast were very lucky here. That's all I have to say. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Have a great rest of your morning and uh, uh, everyone have a great day. I appreciate it, man. Uh, definitely incredibly thankful to the people like Zach and all of the people who are involved in recovering these funds. Um, I probably, you know, I think we'll take some time to digest it and think about it, but it's hard not to argue that it was an optimal outcome uh, for the majority of people involved so grateful for that apologies uh lady uh braids we've got to bring the show to a close now i've run over already hopefully we can hear from you uh in another show but just for a reminder everyone listening in we had more than 200 people live today thank you so much for joining us we do this every single day monday to friday 7 a.m eastern time uh we're live on x we're live on youtube please follow the twitter account at modern market underscore you can subscribe on youtube too to see all of the dis- discussion take place visually including uh all of the tweets we have we get bring them up on the screen if you ever want to see it like that um that's the end of the show guys hope you enjoyed it hope it was helpful hope it was informative have a wonderful day thank you to my co-host legendary and sammy thank you to our speakers nft stats jack oxy lady brains miss a tiro and anyone else and thank you so much for joining have a wonderful day take care we will see you tomorrow bye-bye